refers to a white luscious grape. It is a fruit. This is what they say, Al-Hur Al-Ain is a grape. It is not a, a, a female companion. And really, it is so easy to refute this concept simply by reading the descriptions of the Hur Al-Ain in Jannah. And I want you to read these descriptions, how Allah Azza wa Jal describes the Hur Al-Ain. Grapes are not described the way Hur Al-Ain are described. And I'll leave it at that. I'll leave it at that. Wakawa'iba atraba and other things. No grape can be described the way that Hurun Ain. Another point being, Allah Azza wa Jal clearly says in the Quran about the Hurun Ain, Lam Yatmith Hunna Insun Kablahum Wala Jan. No human being or jinn has polluted them, meaning they are virgins. This is clear in the Quran. There's no such thing as a virgin grape or a widowed grape. Okay, so when you read the descriptions of the Hur in the Quran and especially in the Sunnah, there is no question whatsoever that it is referring to a female companion. Where they get this from, they get it from the fact that there is a word in another language called Syriac, where Hur, if you mispronounce it and you add another mark to it, it becomes something like a grape in that language. And they say this is something from Syriac language. But if I speak to you in Urdu and you try to understand in English, that's a problem. The Quran is in Arabic and for them to assume it is in the Syriac language, it's a problem. So the reality is this position has no scholarly or academic merit to it whatsoever. My name is Salahuddin Ayubi and I'm a software engineer. My first part of the question concerns with whether agnostics or people who are good-hearted because in many of the discourses that I had with non-Muslims regarding Jannah and the concept of the hereafter in Islam the question that they ask is what if a non-Muslim who does not necessarily believe in Islam but does believe that God exists what if his actions and deeds have been good and well-intentioned in this world Will he still be admitted into Jannah? Or will he be thrown into hellfire just because he didn't believe in Islam? Even though everything else that he did in this life turned out to be good. And he'll be remembered for that. The second part of my question relates to uh, another question put up by many non-Muslims to me. That is, when you're talking about Islam to be a balanced religion between materialism and spiritualism, don't you think, since Jannah is a reality, and since Jannah is so clearly defined in the Quran, don't you think the ultimate aim of Islam is to attain the materialism that Jannah describes in the Quran? So how do I explain it, explain it to them that this is ain't materialism, uh, the kind of which you're thinking about, but it's something different? Thank you. Your first question was, is it possible for a person who rejects Islam to enter Jannah? And the response is a unequivocal, explicit no. And that's something that the Quran is very clear about. But I re rephrased your question. And I said, is it possible for a person who rejects Islam to enter Jannah? No. Is it possible for a person who is not aware of Islam who is ignorant of Islam, who has not been exposed to Islam, who has never heard of Islam. Is it possible for such a person to enter Jannah? The response is yes. Allah Azza wa Jal might forgive a certain category of those people and that is a theological issue which we can talk about perhaps in the seminar that I'm going to give in two days. But if a person knows the religion of Islam and has been exposed to it and knowing what it is, he rejects it. There is no question that such a person has rejected the truth. Now you say he lives a life of good. For us as Muslims, this is an oxymoron. You cannot live a life of good without being a true Muslim. In other words, let me give you an analogy. Suppose somebody feeds one poor person every day. Every day he passes by and he goes, he feeds a poor person. And this deed is announced to the public. The public will love him and respect him. But suppose now we find out that along with feeding a poor person, every day he also murders another person. Let me ask you, will that good deed of giving some dal and roti and chawal to a poor person, will that deed 
cause his murder to be forgotten and overlooked? No, you will say murder is much worse than this good deed that you have done. Your evil deed has eclipsed the good that you have done. For us, rejecting Allah, claiming that the Prophet ﷺ was a liar, a'udhu billah. And that's what you're claiming when you say Islam is not true. When you say Islam is not true, you are claiming that the Prophet ﷺ is a liar, a'udhu billah. For us to make this claim is so evil that a lifetime of good cannot make it up. To make a claim that you worship another God besides Allah, and you say this is morally acceptable, it doesn't matter. That evil overshadows all of the other good that you have done. So the question really and truly, no matter how politically incorrect it might be, the reality is our religion is very clear. And by the way, we are not the only religion to believe in this. Christianity also believes the only way to God is through the Son. The only way to the Father is through the path of the Son. Unless you believe in Jesus Christ, you will not be saved. Even if you do it a lifetime of good. Other religions also have the same belief. We call it the belief of salvific exclusivity. That salvation is exclusive to that faith. It is a common belief. Even Hindus and Buddhists, they will tell you, the only way to achieve moksha, the only way to achieve nirvana, is if you follow the path of the yoga, the path of the eightfold path. You cannot achieve it by being a Muslim, by being a Christian, by being any other religion. So the reality is every religion restricts salvation to itself. It's not something only the Muslims say. So when your agnostic or, or atheist friend says this, explain to him this is a reality of every religion. That the religion believes it is the only way to reach salvation. And that is something that you must think about. The second part was how do we explain the materialism uh, of the uh, Jannah? The reality is, as we said, Jannah has more than this materialism. It has as well dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The people of Jannah will remember Allah. It has as well discussions and conversations. In other words, intellectual pursuits. The Quran tells us about the discussions of the people of Jannah. Because of the time constraints, I could not talk about everything. But Jannah is the ultimate realization of the perfection of man. So there is material blessings. There are intellectual blessings. There are blessings of looking at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is everything that the person can desire. It's not just about the materialism. So you explain to this person, Jannah is a healthy mix of everything. But no doubt being who we are, and no doubt we are created from clay and we have a strong animal instinct. Allah Azza wa Jal also emphasizes that instinct and there is nothing to be ashamed or embarrassed about uh, that facet of Jannah. Jazakallah khair.